Uh, well, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It is 10 o'clock, so we will uh, we'll get underway, if you don't mind. And welcome to this meeting of Education and Children's Services Scrutiny Committee. I'm uh, Councillor Graham Newman, and I'll be chairing today's meeting. The meeting is being broadcast live and is available to watch on the Council's website whilst we are in public session. A recording will also be available for viewing following the meeting. Members of the public and the press may also record, film, photograph or broadcast this meeting when the public and the press are not lawfully excluded, providing due courtesy and respect are shown to others in attendance in line with the Council's published guidance. Please ensure that you use the microphone which has been set up for you. Can I also remind you to speak directly into the microphone and please avoid putting anything such as IT equipment or papers in front of the microphone as that will affect the sound quality. Please could you also ensure that your phones and laptops have been switched off or switched to silent. If we just do a quick check myself because vibrate, that looks good. We're just asking for phones to be switched to silent, councillors, by so if you're uh, sure settled, love the job. Yeah, good. There we are. We're not expecting a fire drill today, but in the event of the alarm, alarm sounding, please leave the chamber following the fire exit signs at the rear of the chamber. Fire evacuation instructions can also be found on page four of the agenda. Before we commence today's business, I would like to advise committee members that we have had a change in the membership of our co-opted members. Flavio Vitesse has been replaced by Andy Stone, who is Director of School Services as the Roman Catholic Diocese co-opted member on the committee, but unfortunately he was unable to attend today's meeting. Furthermore, I can confirm that a recruitment exercise is currently underway for the parent governor co-opted member vacancy. The new parent governor co-opted member will be announced on the 8th of November 2022. And this has a, an extra point as well, that um, there has apparently been a police incident on the A14, which may or may not be delaying some people in getting here today, which is a bit of a nuisance, but uh, we will soldier on. Moving on then to agenda item one, which is public questions. Member of the public who is resident or a registered local government elector for Suffolk may ask a question in relation to a substantive item on today's agenda. We have received three public questions. 20 minutes is allowed for public questions. The questions will be taken in the order they were received. I will ask the questioners who are in attendance to take a seat in the chamber. Well, actually, we don't have any in attendance, but never mind, we come to that. Um, I will then ask the appropriate person to respond. Questioners will have up to one minute to ask their question and answers will be recorded as part of the minutes of this meeting. Please could I remind everyone present that it is not the role of this committee to consider individual complaints, as these should be dealt with under the Council's complaints procedure. Furthermore, I would ask you not to refer to individual cases, as this is not appropriate in a public meeting which is being webcast. And can I remind you all that our speakers, all our speakers today, that today's meeting is being broadcast live. Now, question one is from Mrs. Catherine Croton, who is not in attendance today. I will therefore read out the question Mrs. Croton has submitted. Many of the children and young people out of education are those with special educational needs. These children and young people have been let down by Suffolk County Council. The first part of the journey is to meet their needs. This usually starts with help from school. If this is not forthcoming, which, in, which, is, in the, which is the case in most stories I get every day, they apply for and an educational health and care plan needs assessment. But unfortunately, Suffolk County Council refuses at a large number of these requests. In the last few weeks, many parents have come to me saying they have had emails from Suffolk County Council saying they will not access, they will not assess, they will not assess for an educational health and care plan needs assessment until specialist education services 
are involved with the child. This is unlawful. Please can you explain why this is happening? Please can I invite Councillor Rachel Hood as the Cabinet Member to respond, please. Rachel. Yes, thank you, Chair. And um, thank you to Mrs Croton for raising this, but I would like to uh, point out that um, we don't accept everything that is being said in the statement part of uh, Mrs Croton's um, wording. However, uh, Suffolk have reviewed all panels and ensured guidance for the panel and paperwork is legally compliant. This suggests there is still a need to ensure that only the new paperwork is being used, and I've asked the Assistant Director to ensure and confirm that this is the case. Thank you very much indeed. Um, obviously no supplementary because Mr. Croton isn't here. Moving on to question two. This is from Mrs. Emma Evely, and uh, she's not here either, so I'm going to read her question. In July 2021, Suffolk County Council agreed with the Local Government and Social Care Ombudsman to ensure it has a policy in place for providing alternative education to children out of school, which complies with Section 19 of the Education Act 1996. However, the policy produced was inadequate, and on 22nd January 2022, the Local Government Social Care Ombudsman wrote to Suffolk County Council to request the Council widen the policy to ensure it included details on how the Council would provide education <coughs> to those unable to attend school due to the or otherwise reasons included under Section 19 of the Education Act 1996. But this still does not cover the requirements of Section 19 of the Education Act 1996 where children are absent due to illness, exclusion from school, or otherwise. Neither does it provide any detail on the procedure to follow for children who are absent due to other reasons. The second policy was eventually published in July 2022. However, on 10th of October 2022, the Local Government Social and Care Ombudsman has written to Suffolk County Council again, as this second policy still fails to fully address how children who can't attend school for otherwise reasons will be provided with suitable full-time education or how this can be assessed. <clears throat> this is the third time the Local Government Social Care Ombudsman has asked SCC to write an appropriate <clears throat> education other than at school policy. This is completely unacceptable and cannot be fobbed off as a mistake or oversight. When will the Council and the Educational Scrutiny Committee be properly addressing the issues within the Council's education other than at school policy? Councillor Hood, again, can I ask you to respond? Yes, thank you, and thank you to um, <coughs> Ms Everly for her question. And we certainly understand the concerns raised, uh, although I would like to point out that um, Suffolk Council, County Council doesn't... Um, respond to matters by fobbing them off as a mistake or an oversight. Um, the council has in the last few months sought to extend provision to ensure that our duties are met. And our, I'd like to confirm that our policy continues to be reviewed in line with developments in our services, as well as changes to recent Department for Education guidance around attendance. And for example, we have recently reviewed our provision for children under the care of hospitals in Suffolk, and we will be adding in details of this in January when this provision uh, is in place. So we are in discussions with the LGSO, and we will be responding to them uh, before the expiration of the deadline to do that. Thank you very much indeed. And at that answer, along with question one's answer and question three's answer, will be actually uh, transmitted back to the questioners um, after the meeting. That's if they're not watching online now. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, I, I wanted to continue on too because um, we do have more recent guidance. And um, so we continue to seek advice and review our policy to ensure that both the needs of children out of school under the category of otherwise is not at odds with the need to ensure that the local authority is not condoning non-attendance without good reason. And um, by explicitly referencing the provision for otherwise, um, we uh, want to make sure that we are addressing as many children and young people as possible. 
and where a pupil does come under the otherwise criteria, the local authority does consider the child's situation um, via a referral to the alternative tuition service and determine on an individual basis according to the circumstances and the need of each particular child. And in all cases, consideration is given to information provided by rele relevant services in other words, not the local authority, but the other services and agencies involved with individual children. Okay, thank you very much. Did I cut you off there, or did you realise there was something on the other side of a page or something? Uh, it was, sorry, it was slightly more conversational. No, it was, uh, it was all on the same page, but, but um, I, I thought you wanted to speak. And, uh, oh, no, no, that's okay. Thank you. Lovely, I'm sorry if I did. There we are. Um, moving on now to question three, and that's from Mr. Chris Evely who is also not in attendance today, so I'm going to read out his question. In the Education Scrutiny Committee meeting held on the 15th of June 2022, Councillor Hood stated there were 305 children with an education health and care plan who were receiving less than a full-time education offer. Councillor Hood also stated provision is never intentionally withheld or restricted as a result of commissioning gaps. Therefore, why and how are there 305 children with education, health and care plans in Suffolk not receiving suitable full-time education? Councillor Hood. Uh, yes, thank you. And <clears throat> again, thank you to Mr Everly on, on this occasion. So this uh, number to which Mr uh, Everly refers, this 305, isn't 305 today. That, there are at any one time a number of children who are going through a process if they are uh, not in full-time education and they are different children. There are always going to be some children who are between either um, uh, provisions that haven't worked out or um, uh, you know, having their, their needs addressed. So, uh, the data collected from schools via our part-time timetable at the end of last term indicated that there were 110 children with an EHCP not in school full-time. So some, we need to be aware that this can be a short-term uh, matter or um, some suitable education could also include part-time attendance. There's a, a range. Uh, you know, as there are different children coming in and out uh, of um, education which may or may not be uh, addressing their needs. And um, some children may only be attending uh, for one hour a day, whereas others may have, say, one hour less uh, uh, at school a day. And the council absolutely seeks to work with schools to ensure that the offer is suitable for each child and we know children are different, they have different needs. There are other um, cohorts of children who are not receiving full-time education for whom the council also would be in the pr and are in the process of seeking a specialist placement and again I, I need to draw people's attention to the fact that this number you know fluctuates. At the moment there's uh, between 30 and 40 children each week as children um, go on to other education or um, or other provision. The council actively works to identify a suitable school placement for all of these children. And again, the reason for children not receiving a full-time education um, is obviously what we're scrutinizing today. Um, and the papers have provided uh, considerable information to assist our understanding of the very, very many different scenarios that lead to less than full-time education at certain points potentially in a child's or a young person's life and um, uh, I would like to assure the panel that the council is very um, assiduous at addressing uh, these issues. I have finished, thank you Chair. Thank you very much Councillor Hood and again uh, Mr Reed is not in attendance today so we'll be sending that um, answer to him. Councillor Spicer. Um, Thank you, Chairman. C can I make a request, please, um, that for members of this committee, we get given written copies of these questions before the meeting. You're very articulate, and I could just follow you. Um, and I don't mind so much about the answers, but I think it would help us to actually understand the questions fully, if we could all have copies, in the way that we do at full council, 
and are circul circulated at full council to members before the committee. Would that be possible? I mean, there's nothing against that, is there? I'm, I'm sure that is possible. <laughs> Yeah, we'll yes, just have yeah. a, a, I mean, you, you read them out. Just I mean, I think the only issue has been that um, yeah. the cut-off date is midnight two days before, isn't it, I believe? I, I'm happy to have them in front of me at the meeting, but it just would be very much easier, particularly if the um, quest person putting the questions was here, for us to think through the question and then follow the answers. We'll arrange that then for future meetings. Yeah. Okay, I'm moving on now then to um, agenda item two, which is apologies for absence and substitutions. Um, we've received apologies for absence from the following people. Sally Evans, who's one of our parent governor co-opted members. Councillor Sam Murray, she's substituted by Councillor Jessica Fleming. Councillor Elaine Bryce, who's substituted by Councillor David Goldsmith. And as I mentioned earlier, An Andy Stone, the Roman Catholic Diocesis co-opted member um, also cannot make it today. Um, are there any other? I don't think there are any other people we're expecting. Um, yeah, I did send Moving swiftly on to item three, declarations of interest and dispensations. Can I ask the committee please if there are any declarations of interest or dispensations required? No? Okay, thank you very much. Confirmation of the minutes of um, the meeting we held on the 15th of June 2022. Um, any can't, Councillor Martin? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I have a very clear recollection uh, that the issue of uh, resources available for the SEND services was discussed mm -hmm. and that uh, we were assured that. Uh, that would be included in the issue about the progress on recruitment and capacity. That's recommendation A7. Um, so I wonder if we could add a little uh, phrase to A7 saying progress on recruitment and capacity within SEND services, including the resources available for the service. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just. Um, this is on page 14. Right Oh, right, there we are. So Sorry, the, I should have said. So, do you, do you have some revised wording that you would... Yes, like? uh, thank you, Chair, yes. So, if, if we could, if it could say, progress on recruitment and capacity within SEND services, including the resources available for the service. note of that. Any other amendments anyone wishes to bring to notice? No? Well, do I need to take a vote on that amendment? No. no. Okay. Oh, right. And um, as you will note in, uh, in item A on that same page there, we seem to have uh, gone forward a year. That was actually the 14th of December. Hang on a sec. <laughs> Now that's right. He's right, isn't it? Oh, no, that one's right. Yes, sorry. That was there. It's, it's where? No, sorry, this one. Yep, we are fine, aren't we? Yes, yep. Yeah, that's it. Apologies for that. Thank you very much. Okay. <clears throat> so we're moving on now to our main topic for scrutiny today, which is item five, and children missing from education. Agenda item five sets out information on Suffolk's position of children missing from education and the statutory duties and responsibilities of schools, local authorities and parents in relation to children and young people. The objective of this item is to consider the issues relating to children and young people who are not at school, college or appropriate training and what actions the council is taking to address this. The key areas of investigation are, uh, are for today are shown on pages 23 to 24 of the agenda pack. Um, I believe 50 members have actually received an email with a correction on page 51, paragraph 94, summary of trends of not 
of young people not in employment or education or training, typically there are around 17,500 young people in the year 12-13 cohort each year. This should read, typically there are around 15,000 young people in year 12-13 cohort for each year. The report has been amended to reflect the correction on the Council's website. Can I now welcome our panel today? Please can I ask you all to introduce yourselves, starting off with Councillor Hood, please. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. So I am the Cabinet Member, I'm Rachel Hood, Cabinet Member for Education, Special Educational Needs and Disability and Skills. To Councillor James Reader. Yes, good morning, James Reader. I am Cabinet Member for Children and Young People Services. Thank you very much. Now, we were expecting Executive Director for People Services, uh, Mrs. Sue Cook. Unfortunately, she has not turned up, and we haven't heard, I don't think, where she is. Am I right in saying that? She is never coming. Okay, thank you very much. Regrettably, Mr. Alan Cadzo is unwell today and has been in contact with me overnight twice. Um, giving me an update on his medical status, but um, he's not well enough to come today, so um, we wish him um, good wishes for a swift recovery. Mr. Adrian Orr, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, my name's Adrian Orr, Assistant Director, Education, Skills and Learning. Thank you. And can we go through our um, witnesses? I think um, Stuart Hudson first, please. Matthew Cook. And Mr. Martin Hull, please. Uh, Martin Hull, Intelligence Hub Lead for Education and Learning. Fran Alexander. Good morning. Um, I'm Fran Alexander, Head of SEND Services. Thank you very much. And Izzy Connell, please. Morning. Izzy Connell, Head Teacher of the Specialist Education Services. Maria Howe. Maria Howe, Deputy Head of the Specialist Education Services, responsible for inclusion. And Angela Davy, please. Good morning. Angela Davy, Admissions Team Manager. Thank you very much. Lindsay Last, please. Good morning. Um, Lindsay Last, the elected Elective Home Education Consultant. And Michael Gray. Please. Good morning, Michael Gray, Head of Skills. And Clive Mobbs. Good morning, Clive Mobbs, um, Participation Manager, Post-16 Education. And I think we have Nimone here as well, Nimone. Yes. Good morning to you. So thank you all very much for your attendance today. Now, we were going to have two representatives from Unity Schools Partnership due to attend today to talk to the committee about the challenges schools are facing with absences from school and what that partnership is doing to address these challenges and to tackle school absences. We were notified late yesterday afternoon that the partnership now have Ofsted in, I think, three of their schools. Um, so, unfortunately, their representatives are not able to attend today. So, I'm going to invite um, Councillor Rachel Hood, please, to kick off and make an introductory speech. Thank you, Chair. I'm very happy to be here today, and I believe it is timely for the Education and Children's Services Scrutiny Committee, as you are to doing, to take an in-depth look at the issues relating to children and young people who are missing from education of any sort, why they are missing, um, and what is being done to address this local and national concern. The immediate and long-term effects for children who don't attend school or receive a suitable education are well known in terms of risks to their safety, their own learning, and ultimately their life chances. 
Suffolk County Council has been proactive in tackling absence, in identifying children missing from education uh, and young people who are um, without any education for whatever reason, and assisting children uh, or young people to return to school or further education, as well as creating new education provision to support children with additional needs. There is obviously more for the council to do, particularly with regard to children with special educational needs and disability who require specialist placements. I also welcome the focus that the Children's Commissioner for England, Dame Rachel D'Souza, has brought to this issue nationally, mm -hmm. highlighting the need for a robust universal system to ensure that children and young people do not fall through the net or go missing generally and certainly missing their education. It is positive that the government has recognised the need for changes nationally and proposals in the school's white paper of 2022 set out a requirement for a national register to ensure that no child is missing from education. And I think we can recognise many people actually don't realise that there hasn't been a, a register for children. Uh, you know, it's something I think that we would all expect that there would be and there isn't. And again, I'd like to thank the committee for focusing on this issue because it's vitally important. I, I, I know we all agree on that. <coughs> so, <coughs> excuse me, we have the detailed report prepared by officers. And as you can see, there's a, a, a large range of officers here um, from the Children and Young People's Directorate and elsewhere. And this describes how data is being used, we hope, as effectively as possible to identify and track children and young people, um, as well as describing the factors, and there are many and varied, that can uh, lead to children and young people not being in any kind of education. Obviously, there are challenges around access to data described in the report, but in spite of this, I believe the level of oversight that the council is bringing to prioritizing uh, children and young people being in education is significant and focused. Um, obviously, um, we and the team were hoping that the, uh, uh, the committee would hear directly from school representatives from the Unity Schools Partnership Multi-Academy Trust, so it's disappointing to us all that they are not here. and. Um, I didn't actually know until this morning that they weren't going to be here. And it was planned that they would be here to share their experience of the challenges schools face and the work that they are doing to tackle absence and uh, ensure children uh, and uh, young people are not missing from education. So the focus of this scrutiny meeting and the questions that um, I know the committee members will be asking will provide a valuable opportunity um, to the teams on, on this side of the chamber to review the council's work and uh, I'm absolutely certain will assist in further developing our plans and actions and support the county council's ambition that no child or young person slips through the net uh, or misses out on education. So again, just to sum up, um, the team here welcome your inquiries and we'll obviously be doing the best we can to answer them, and if there's anything we need to take away, um, we'll be happy to, to do so. So thank you very much, Jess. Thank you very much. Any more lovely questions on what Councillor Hood has just said? Councillor Orton. Yes, it's actually nothing to do with Suffolk County Council specifically, but it's on the new schools bill, um, particularly about um, education out of school. I just wonder whether we know, will that include some paragraph or something on safeguarding? Rather than answer you <laughs> generally, um, uh, Adrian Orr, I'm sure, can answer you more specifically. Councillor Otton, thank you for your question. Um, the bill at the moment um, is still passing between the Lords and the Commons and has stalled a little bit. Um, around the issues of academy accountability. 
So we're waiting to hear what will happen next. What we know is in the discussions with um, colleagues in the Department for Education, there are links to or proposed links around the revised 2022 guidance keeping children safe in education. Indeed, one of the things that will be revealed, um, I suspect through your questioning, through the committee's questioning, is that there are some variations in the, in, in the number of regulations, and they don't all align, uh, and, and I know um, civil servants in, in the Department for Education would like to do that. So I can't say what the explicit line will be, but there were amendments made to keeping children safe in education, a document that's central to schools, central to us in the local authority around the whole safeguarding agenda. And our expectation is, for example, around um, there being a national register, that it will link directly to that document. But watch this space. I, I hope that's helpful. Um, yeah, um, absolutely. But I, I just think it would be useful to know if there was any um, suggestion that safeguarding was not being implicit within the rules of the new bill. I think it would be very useful for us to know that so that we could in fact lobby anybody that we feel would have any influence. Thank you. On that. We, 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 we could certainly undertake to provide perhaps a briefing note once we see the detail um, of the um, of the bill, as I say, at the moment it's very tied up around some specific technical issues, and those of you that that will be reading the detail of it, as I'm sure some will, will know it's around the challenges from Lord Nash, Lord Baker, and Lord Agnew, um, Baroness Baron is dealing with those, and it will move on when that's been dealt with. Thank you very much, Councillor Topping. You wanted to raise. It. Thank you. Yes, I, I've got to say I was shocked when I read that in, in England there is no single central record of where children of compulsory school age are educated. And also in that same paragraph seven on page 30, parents who have never sent their children to school have no legal obligation to, to inform the council. I thought that was also very shocking. Um, and I did sneakily just ask um, Officer Adrian Orr, there are some numbers here based on the 2021 census of 161,000 children in Suffolk between the age of zero and 18 years. And then the school census in May 22 recorded only 104,458. And I said to Adrian, where are all those extra children? And he said, some of them are in the zero to five year olds, which are not yet of compulsory school age. And we don't know how many of those there are in the county. So that makes my numbers horrendous. But when you take out those children that we don't know of between zero and five, that actually brings the numbers down, which did slightly reassure me, but I'm still not wholly reassured. We, we need to know where these children are because it is a safeguarding issue. And so if anybody can put any influence on the people that are passing these bills, we need to tighten down on these numbers and know where these children are for their own protection. Thank you. Right, thank you very much for that. Now, I think coming to, do you want to come back on that, um, Councillor Hood? Uh, if, yes, if I may, because uh, as I said in my opening words, <clears throat> I think it's a surprise probably to almost everybody, um, perhaps not to the um, long-term professionals, that, there, that you can have children who are never sent to school and nobody apparently knows where they are. Now, um, I agree when I read paragraph seven to, you, you know, you take out the not to five children, you take out the children who are privately educated um, and, you know, you go on to all these other things. So those numbers do come down. But at the end of the day, until there is a register, we won't actually know. And I, I believe that that's what people want to be lobbying for. I think uh, Adrian Orr wants to say something. Thank you, Councillor Hood, and thank you, Councillor Topping, for the question. That's at the heart of our hope that the um, elements of the bill that will bring in a national registration arrangement um, will assist us to do that. I think it's important to say that that gap in um, the number between 0 and 18 and those in school isn't as stark as it will as it appears because there will be a lot of children that are privately educated. There will be children privately educated in Suffolk, a significant number of private schools, and then there are many families in Suffolk that will send their children to private schools in other parts of the 
parts of the country. But we'll, we won't get a full picture of that until there is a, 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 a much better national system. So any um, support you can bring in lobbying around that, because the bill is still just a bill at the moment, uh, I think would be welcomed by officers not just in Suffolk, but in other county councils and local authorities as well. Thank you very much. Do you want to come in on the back of that, uh, Councillor Bridger, then I'll come to Councillor Martin, yeah? Yeah, thank you very much. I'd just like to reassure, in particular, Councillor Otten's question, that whilst it's not in the legislation, there's a huge amount of work that goes between Rachel's portfolio and myself with safeguarding. So, you know, please rest assured that here in Suffolk County Council, we are working very hard to make sure that safeguarding goes across everything. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Martin, please. Yes, thank you very much. I mean, obviously, uh, having a register will be incredibly helpful. Um, but uh, there are a group of children in the country who we do have a register of, of course, which is the refugee children, and hundreds of those have gone missing. Uh, so it's not just about having a register, it's also about squaring the circle uh, between uh, giving schools autonomy and, uh, and giving parents autonomy and giving the local authority some uh, actual powers and responsibilities. And I think uh, there's, a, there's a serious issue here about uh, the extent to which the local authority is actually able uh, to monitor or direct anybody. Um, I would just add that uh, with the schools bill, I don't think, um, I may not be absolutely right about this, but I think I probably am, that it's now reached the stage where you can't actually make any influence on it unless you are either a member of the House of Commons or a member of the House of Lords. There's, there's a period of time during which public lobbying helps, but once it's got to the stage where it's going backwards and forwards with amendments in the House of Commons and Lords, then I think that stage is probably gone. And let's face it, Councillor Martin, you would know this, wouldn't you? <laughs> anyway, um, can I move on now to um, Mr Orr, who's just going to give us a brief outline of the paper and draw particular issues to our attention therein. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I intend doing a relatively brief introduction, if I may, because I think we need to give the bulk of the time um, in this scrutiny panel for questions. Um, you will note, and Councillor Hood um, said, there are a lot of officers here. There are slightly more officers than there perhaps would be at other scrutinies. Um, that's not because people haven't got lots of things to do. It's the importance of this issue. And it's, it, it demonstrates that there are relatively few teams across the Children and Young People's Directorates that are not directly involved in work to address the issue of children who may not be in school. I hope the paper illustrates effectively um, some of the vast range of reasons that can lead to a child not, not attending school regularly or not being in suitable education. Um, and I hope that's been helpful and insightful for um, committee members to see that, that broad range of challenges. Because behind every one of those um, reasons for a child um, not, not being in school or receiving a suitable education. Um, there's a whole biography of their family circumstances, the situations they're in, and different teams have different responsibilities um, and different activities and actions to try and tackle that. So that's why we've got a slightly bigger number of officers um, here today, so that we are able to field, I'm certain, the, re the wide range of questions um, that you will bring to us. I think the other thing that I would say, um, echoing both um, Councillor Hood's comments um, and Councillor Reader's comments, in spite of the fact there are some structural challenges in the system, that in no way reduces, if anything, it increases our collective efforts as officers to look for different ways to ensure that we are tracking children, that we are where we hear that children have gone missing. Um, the example that, that, that you gave, Councillor Martin, about refugee children, I think that is becoming a, a national issue. Um, my colleague, um, Stuart Hudson, who leads on attendance, leads a small but effective team um, working on children missing education. They link with our neighbouring authorities. They link with a national data children missing education database where we know <coughs> excuse me, that a child may have gone missing in Suffolk from a school or a setting and we can't, our inquiries don't find them, we put them on that database, sometimes they turn up somewhere else. Similarly, 
Stuart's team find children in Suffolk that went missing in other parts of the country. So there is a, there's a lot of activity of that nature um, going on. However, um, we welcome the challenge and the oversight because we know there is more that we can do. Um, we, we work very closely with schools. It's disappointing that our colleagues from Unity can't be here, but I think entirely understandable given the Ofsted focus they've got in their schools. Um, a number of us are former school leaders, so we recognise the challenges that, that schools face. Um, I, I was with um, a group of Academy Chief Executives and the Regional Director um, for, for the Department for Education a week ago and one of the discussions was around attendance and the significant amount of leadership time in schools that is being given over to attendance because the, the issues are complex. So schools themselves, in the same way that the authority is investing um, significant focus on this, individual schools, one CEO of a large multi-academy trust, it's got schools in Ipswich and other parts of the county, said to me, it's the first thing I do when I get into the office in the morning is, is everybody in? Are there any children that aren't here? And do we know why they're not here? So I'd want to assure um, the committee that our colleagues in schools, uh, in academies, are taking this issue very seriously. And we are always looking for ways that we can work more effectively and more collaboratively. Um, so I'm not going to say, say much more than that. It's a complex issue. We hope that the report has given you some insights, but more importantly, your questions will allow um, you to gain further insight into this really important area. I I'm going to stop there, um, Mr. Chair, if I may, and um, hand over to questions. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Orr. Um, does anyone want to come, come back on what uh, Mr. Orr has just said, or do we want to now go on to di discussing the paper itself? No? Okay, then, well, let's fire off uh, some questions based on your reading of the papers, please. And Councillor Topping is first with a hand up. Thank you. Page 32, bullet point 17, admissions, refusals outside the normal rounds of admissions. I wasn't aware, and now I am, that academies have their own admission procedures. Um, I just thought if my child wanted to go to a school in Suffolk, we just applied to Suffolk County Council and then you gave me a place, but that's not the way it goes. Um, I, could somebody explain to me, please, how the admissions policy works in an academy, especially outside of normal rounds? Because I am aware, and this is obviously going to be happening all over the place, but I'm aware of a family just happens to be a refugee family, but that's beside the point. This could happen to anybody that's applying to an academy outside of the normal rounds. Um, and that family weren't informed that they had not got a place. Um, they panicked, they eventually contacted me, and I went through the procedure, which is now how I sort of understand how it works. But I think it would be worth explaining to everybody how that works and what the time scales are that parent should have been informed a lot earlier so that Suffolk County Council could place the children. Thank you. We'd like to take that. Uh, if I may make a, just a quick start on that, and then I'm going to invite my, my colleague, Angela Davey, who's one of the admissions managers. Um, just on your first point, Councillor Topping, um, around 75, 76% of children um, in school in Suffolk attend an academy uh, in 41 different academy trusts and they can all have different um, admissions arrangements. They're, they're broadly similar, but there will be some, some differences and variations. Um, that's not necessarily a bad thing because we work collectively, we work collaboratively. And in fact, even before academies existed, um, some church schools, voluntary aided church schools are their own admission authority. So it's not a new space um, for the council, but it is one perhaps that, that parents and councillors might not um, have been aware of. Um, we also, if as a council, if we think there is something not quite right with um, uh, the admissions policy in a school that's its own admissions authority, we will politely ask for a change and, and if that isn't forthcoming we may, 
we may put a more formal challenge in. In many cases, we deal with that in advance. But in terms of that technical issue about how it works, I'm going to, if I may, hand over to Angela Davey. Thank you. So we don't coordinate in-year admissions um, in Suffolk, so it does mean that parents have to go directly to an academy or an own admission authority school, so voluntary aided, to apply. Um, once an application has been made, the admissions authority must respond to um, the application, notify the parents in writing within 15 school days. Um, so if they're offering a place, that's to be confirmed in writing, or if they're refusing a place, that also needs to be confirmed in writing. If they are refusing an application, then they must be given the right to appeal before an independent appeal panel. Um, when parents apply directly to an academy or known admission authority school, they are then um, required to send us details of those out outcomes. Um, if they are refusing a child, then they are to send us a copy of the refusal letter and the application form so that we can be aware of that child. And if they are without a local school place, we can then advise them of the nearest school with places available, if that's um, also an academy or voluntary aided or free school, um, or we will offer um, a place if it's a community or voluntary controlled school. But we are reliant on the academies informing us of those outcomes in a uh, timely manner. But I think I would go on to say as well that if we do become aware through any particular channels um, of um, children not getting the outcomes, uh, we will um, check that out with the Academy Trust and challenge and investigate where we need to. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that. Do, do you mind, uh, uh, Councillor Rotten, if I just come back on that particular question, because I was just wondering, where we get children being refused admission to a school, which is perhaps the one just, just around the corner, particularly in our kind of rural areas where the next school may not be particularly near, do we find that that leads to children getting lost from the system or parents um, you know, saying, well, I'll, I'll educate at home for, you know, for, the, for this phase of education, like primary or secondary? Um, does that lead to any trouble, or do we find the vast majority of the alternatives offered do get taken up and, and, and parents um, appear to be satisfied with the result? I think it would be fair to say that there are some families who um, are not satisfied with what is being offered as an alternative or suggested as an alternative. And I think that um, there may be difficulties for some in getting to an alternative school. Obviously, if the nearest school with spaces available is over the statutory walking distance, then they will be eligible for funded school transport, and we will advise families if that is the case or help them through that process. Um, and if they do opt in for school travel, but they aren't eligible because they don't meet the statutory walking distance, then they have that right to re review or appeal. Um, but it could be that that does lead to some um, children uh, being out of school for slightly longer than what we would want them to be whilst we're working through that process. Would you go on to say that, that you know, in some instances that leads to the kind of issue that we're talking about, which is children just missing education as a consequence? Is, is it a big number? Is it 1%? Is it you know, half a percent? Is it 0.1%? Any ideas on that? It's a fairly dynamic number because mid-year admissions can be any time during the year. Um, and we've not got that number in front of us, but we can get that as a snapshot for today. Um, we, just, we just need to, to provide it. Um, I think at the heart of your question, uh, Mr Chair, is, is this a route way for a child going missing from the yeah. system? Um, w w because we know that child has been refused a place and we're trying to find a place and the parent may not want the one that's that's offered at least we know that child is there it's not good that they're not in school but they haven't fallen through the net um, and not that we're not concerned about that we are much con more concerned about those that we don't know really about, don't know about and, yeah. and hopefully that's helpful okay thanks for that council oh, yeah, please do yeah and then council rotten next then Councillor Spicer, then Sorry. Councillor Fleming. Sorry, the bit I'm struggling with is you're relying on the academy to tell you that that child has been refused a place. If the academy, for whatever reason, 
you know, short, shortage of staff, overworked, etc., etc. I don't know. If for whatever reason that academy hasn't informed you, Suffolk County Council, us, that that child is not in education, that's where I'm struggling because that child is then missing. I'll, I'll check in with my colleague in, in uh, admissions in a moment. Um, my sense from the information that I see is that the vast majority of academies are providing that information. I think the timing at different points in the year, particularly in holiday periods where there may be fewer people in the office, um, as it were, um, that can slow things down. So would I, be, I think I'd be right in saying, um, Angela, that sometimes the issue is the delay in the time the academy um, informs us rather than not informing us at all? Uh, certainly delay in the timing of them telling us that is, you know, that can be an issue. And as you said, the summer holidays is a particularly long period of time. Um, there are times, and it's not very often, but we do become aware of children through other channels. Um, and so where we believe an application has been made and parents haven't been informed of the outcome, um, then we become aware of that. We will then pick that up with the school. Um, and it could just be that it's a, it just hasn't been sent to us in a timely manner, as just said. Um, and we can, can easily resolve that from a conversation with the school. OK, Councillor Otten, please, next. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, when um, Rachel D'Souza did this report, I mean, I'm pleased to say that Suffolk you know, is not suffering like some parts of the country. And also, it is pleased to read within this report um, that the numbers have actually, over the years, reduced. Um, I suppose the only disappointment is the number of students that are not in education or training still remains very much the same. Um, and that seems to be a cohort where there is continually a problem with getting them into some sort of educational training. Um, a couple of questions on that. Um, on page 86, um, paragraph, I don't know if it's, no, it's paragraph 86, beg your pardon, <laughs> um, about children um, as a result of COVID. I'd like to know how many have still not returned to school um, and is there still a, que a question there um, where it says in the, um, in the fourth quarter. Um, and the other one, um, a bit of a technical question again, is those children that are obviously registered as being unwell and even in hospital, I have been told in the past that there has been concerns about the level of education of children whilst they are in hospital. And I'd be interested to know if that is still an issue and if there is still an improvement in satisfaction. And the third question is on paragraph 72. Um, I just wonder whether we could break those numbers down. Um, into eth ethnicity and whether or not is there a is there an issue there that the majority may be we do hear that you know sometimes it is young black boys that are the most that are excluded from school or have reasons to not be in school and would that be useful to know that information thank you chairman sorry about my <coughs> Thank you very much for that, Councillor Otten. Mr Hall. Thank you, Councillor Otten. I'm going to bring one or two colleagues in, if I may. Um, on that first one about the um, children returning to school after COVID, um, I I'm going to invite Stuart Hudson um, in a moment. Um, the Suffolk school system during that pandemic, and let's hope we don't see the likes of it again, in my view, did a remarkable job. And although there were some children not in school, all Suffolk schools stayed open. That didn't happen in, in, in all of the country. There was a, a, a very strong collaboration and coordination with schools and academies supporting each other. 
and generally our numbers of children not returning are low, we believe, compared to other parts of the country. Um, my hypothesis, and, and I'll, I'll bring in um, my subject matter experts, um, is that some of those young people that have not returned um, f f after the sort of pandemics actually are young people where there were attendance issues prior to the pandemic and it's exacerbated the situation rather than being the cause. But I'd like to invite Stuart to... Sorry about that. Um, yes, the, the pandemic did have a massive impact upon lots of families. And I think it's, it's fair to say that a lot of children did get into the habit of not actually going to school. What we have seen going forward is that the numbers have really decreased as such, but the, they are children that we think historically still had educational attendance barriers. So what we're sort of seeing is it is a levelling out process now and the children that are talked about in the quarter four of last year are children that we would expect to be in that cohort still. So there will be those that are missing edu that are CME. They are those children that do have uh, a numerous different attendance barriers, and that could be medical, that could be um, transport issues, but it is a levelling playing field. And as, as Adrian has said, it's a constant change of numbers. As you get one child in, another one will become problematic. So. To put an actual number on it is really very difficult because it's a constant changing process. And I think that's the, the best answer I can give you on, on this area around children coming back after COVID. If I may, I'm going to bring in um, my colleague, um, Izzy Connell and Maria Howe around hospital education, which I think was your second question. Yeah, I think I'll field, field this one. Um, around hospital schools, we do have um, we do have a hospital uh, school in based in Ipswich Hospital, and uh, we will have one opening in January in uh, West Suffolk Hospital. There are around at any one time there are around um, fifteen to twenty children in hospital beds in one hospital and similar number in the other. So you're looking around sort of thirty to forty children. Um, some of those are for short short period of time, some of them obviously longer, um, and with the increased um, sort of children suffering from mental health that are actually um, hospitalised, that's an increasing uh, problem, hence uh, we have strengthened the commissioning around that, that piece of work. Um, the hospital schools also have the responsibility of following up with um, schools around children that may well be um, in and out, uh, going into hospital in and out to make sure that that education um, is continued um, and they also operate a uh, medical needs in schools um, offer for schools to support children that are um, have medical needs and are attending schools as well so that offer there is um, you know it has uh, improved over recent um, months um, I think the Ipswich Hospital uh, was always a very strong offer um, around children that needed that uh, extra support while they were attending um, hospital appointments or were inpatients. Um, the hospital in the north of the county is actually run by Norfolk County Council um, and we have um, liaised with them around the offer that they provide but since it's a Norfolk hospital, while some Suffolk children do go to that hospital, uh, their offer extends to um, children that are attending Suffolk schools um, even though they are Norfolk children, uh, Norfolk Hospital, if that makes sense. And I, I, if I may bring in um, my colleague Martin Hole around the breakdown of the data 
on the persistent absence, whether that can be broken down by ethnicity. Um, I don't think we can do it this instant, but Martin will let us know what's possible. <laughs> Thank you, Adrian. Uh, yes, I, I see no reason why we can't, we won't be able to break that down. Um, I think one of the other things just to bring to your attention is that the DfE are now collecting attendance data twice daily from, uh, as of this morning, 248 schools in Suffolk. Um, there are issues with us getting it at a level of granularity um, that will allow us, but I believe that that will include the ethnicity data. So we are working with the DfE on getting the data that we would require. Um, so I can see no reason in the future why we can't produce that for you. Can I come in the back of, um, of uh, Councillor Ogden's question? It's really about the difference, or, or the figures in paragraph 65, and then the figures in paragraph 72. Um, because uh, tw um, in the 2019-20 year, you know, particularly sort of the early part of that year, we had no trace of COVID in the system at all. It didn't really pop up until um, uh, later in the, in the, in the school year. Um, so that was a very high figure, 1,412, and this is all pre-COVID, wasn't it? Um, that's one thing. And then whilst we show reducing numbers of children missing education going forward into 21-22 and 22-23, when you look at the bottom of the table on page 72, actually overall attendance has fallen in that time. And I didn't quite understand how that could be. As overall attendance, the third column, it says. I'm looking at the third column on the table on uh, paragraph 72. Oh, I'm looking at, sorry, the numbers in paragraph 65. Yeah, well, those numbers are reducing, whereas when you look at the, um, uh, at the, at, at the um, overall attendance, like, say, in a academic year 21-22, they've gone down. So the yeah, yeah, overall attendance has gone down, but apparently we've got less children missing education in that time. Right. Yeah. Data set, I appreciate yes, that. It but, is. Um, um, <laughs> I think it's the figures that you have for CME uh, are the number of cases where there is a child not on a school roll. So that is a very specific area. So that means that ch a child does not appear on any school roll, and they are the ones that we know about. Back in 2019-20, uh, yeah, the figures were very high. We ha have improved our systems, our processes. We haven't got any more staff, but we've been a lot more effective um, in tracing children that are not on a school roll. And this is because we work much more in partnership with other agencies, DWP, the police, um, other local authorities, um, schools. And what we've been able to do by more efficient processes over the years, you can see that the numbers have gone down. Yeah? And I've just had a look at my latest uh, numbers and uh, we're up to 791, but this is not expected for this time of the year as such. By the end of quarter two, that's, we, we get a peak as children come, or schools come back after the summer term, and we can actually see uh, which children are missing. It takes, takes the system a bit of a time to move forward, and we find these children. Some will have just moved within Suffolk, some would have left the country, and we just we we go through lots of um, looking at safeguarding issues because CME is all about safeguarding. That that's the real important part. We will do checks to find out where these children are. The data that you looked at is the attendance data. Now that is an overall figure that doesn't take into account children missing education because they're not on the school roll. It's a different set of numbers. Does that help? It does indeed. Thank you very Good. much for explaining that to me. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Councillor Spicer, I think, next. <coughs> Chairman, I've often said I don't really like the scrutiny process, and this morning is no different. So
so, and it doesn't help when you sit in a traffic jam on the A14 on the way. Um, what I come here to do is not just to learn lots of very interesting things, but to actually go away thinking that from what we've learnt, we've managed to make some suggestions, recommendations, that might make a difference. And in talking with all of you, my colleagues, this morning, I focused on paragraph 11, right at the beginning, page 31, which is the reasons. And then I looked through those reasons, and I thought, how many of these could we, as a county council scrutiny committee, speaking to our cabinet colleagues and officers, actually change or make, well, make a difference, make an improvement or help. <clears throat> and looking at those bullet points, and they're all picked up in different ways in the text then that follow through. I felt that, we, well, we've discussed exclusions in the past for this committee, haven't we? Yeah, at length. Um, the whole issue of part-time timetables and, and medical absence is something which is extremely interesting to read about, but I'm not sure that, the, uh, and indeed welcome what we've just been told about the hospitals, but I'm not sure what we could recommend today that would make that different. Um, the bullet point of waiting a placement is something that I'm sure we all are deeply conscious of because of the work we've done in this committee and again the questions this morning from parents uh, relating to SEND provision. So what I hope we could just spend a bit more time on is persistent, ab the elective home education. I'm really interested in why that counts as not being in education. I think we could talk about that. Th and then obviously what we've just started to touch on, um, CME, and because that's where we ought to be able, to, from a range of policies, to actually think about things. I'm not certain what bail condition, well, I can guess what bail conditions means, but I doubt there's anything any of us here in edu looking at scrutiny could make a difference about. Um, and I, I don't understand fully the difference between persistent absence. Um, I think that's a recording process, in, in the way I read that, rather than, um, and so uh, ch persistent absence leads to CME. So could we talk, please, and I also want to talk about refugees right at the end, um, fairly obviously. Um, can we talk, please, a little bit more about elective home education? Um, and I was looking at paragraphs 22 onwards and ask why, what we should be concerned about, why this cancer is not being in education, um, and whether, you know, there's some interesting facts here. Have any of the officers here today got any suggestions about how we should view elective home education and whether we ought to be taking any steps about it? And then I'd like to go back to CME section, if possible. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Orr. Thank you, Councillor Spicer. Uh, let me start off with elective home education and I'm gonna bring in my colleague, um, Lindsay Last, um, if I just say a few things first. Um, your question, why is it in here? Um, <clears throat> we thought long and hard about putting that in this section because elective home education, and, and I'm sure many colleagues will be aware, um, is a right sort of enshrined going back to the 1944 Education Act where a parent can choose to educate their child at home. Um, and there's a very strong um, elective home education lobby nationally. Um, our concern is not about those families who are electing to home educate and then educating their families. Our concern is um, those that are saying they're going to home educate their children, but their children are not receiving a suitable education. Now that's a very oversimplified view of this cohort because what we've seen in the growth of elective home education um, are families who are dissatisfied with the system, and that can be for a variety of reasons. It could be because there's bullying, it, be, it's, it could be because they feel their child's needs are not being met effectively in the school that is available, or it could be that they want, they want a place in a school that they're not able to get, get the place in. So we felt we needed to include um, elective home education as part of this, not because we believe 
that those committed home educators are not educating their children. There are families in Suffolk doing a very good job ed as home educators, but that isn't true uh, across the whole um, system. But I'm going to invite... Sorry. Because does that include the number of parents that are dissatisfied with their children send education and therefore feel that's the only way? Does that include those and how many are they? There will be a number of families in that cohort <coughs> where send, but by no means are they the majority. Um, but I'm going to Your mic's not on, um, Mr. Orr. Your mic wasn't. Oh, my. It's not so much in here. I'll invite my colleague Lindsay Last in now, if I may, to add. Hi. Um, the elective home education team's role is to, first of all, establish those people or those families who've made the decision to electively home educate and therefore the children who are home educated and once they've established that the young person is educated at home is to make uh, contact with that family or the parent and ask for information to uh, assure the local authority that that young person is in receipt of a suitable education now uh, the, the law is that at that point the parent is not lawfully required to provide the local authority with that information, but it is um, advisable to do so. Um, most parents do choose to share that information, and some don't. Um, so our job is to contact those parents, to try and establish a positive engagement in relationship with those parents, gather that information, um, support them if they want support, but otherwise to be assured of the education provision they are making for their child it is meeting their needs. Um, when we are not able to establish that, or whether we have established that it isn't meeting the young person's needs, we have a duty to either support the parent to change that in a very short space of time, or to require that parent to put their child back into a school place. So at that point, where education is deemed unsuitable or where in fact we don't have any information at all and therefore we can't make that decision, we um, make pass, begin formal processes where that work is then picked up by Stuart's team, the CME team, and as a process and a formal process entered for, for where by the law requires the parent to provide that piece of information or to put their child on a school role okay so that's the general job of the the ehe team can, can i just respond on that is there anything that you would like to see done differently um only the kind of questions that you guys have asked earlier on today this it's it would be very helpful if we knew all of the children who were being home educated. So we are well aware of those children who are home educated where their parents have chosen to tell the local authority and that's their choice, or where their young person has previously been on a school role where it is required for the school to let us know that that young person has been removed for the, from the role uh, under the, the code of elective home education because the parent has indicated clearly that they wish to take responsibility, as is their right, to home educate their child. Okay, thanks for that. Are you happy with that, Councillor Spicer? Uh, yes, I, 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 think, I, I think we're just, as I say, very interesting. I'm not certain any of us can go away and think we could do things differently as a result of, of that as it is the situation. Could, could we talk a bit more then about the CME children?
I, I, I was just going to just to add um, to the point that Lindsay made about where things could be different, um, and notwithstanding um, Councillor Martin's sort of uh, you know helpful oversight of where the sort of political process is. Um, I think there is lobbying around this register, possibly with MPs who would still have some, you know, so, so, some input on it. Um, uh, as Lindsay has said, we know a number of home educating families because they were in a Suffolk school and they've chosen to, to home educate and the school is legally obliged to tell us that the parents told them. Um, we have a whole raft of parents who come forward and tell us. I, I, I don't want there to be a sense that not all, you know, the home educating parents don't want to talk to the county council. That isn't true. But there will be a cohort who perhaps came into Suffolk, li lived in another authority, or their child's never been in school. The point that Councillor Topping made right at the beginning of the meeting, her observation on the paper, that we simply do not know about. So as officers in Suffolk today, in this room, we do not know how many families are educating their children at home. And that's not a Suffolk issue, that's a national issue. So any lobbying around this national registration, um, I think, can help us. Thank you. Mrs. Sheet, did you want to come in on this? Oh, OK. In that case, then, come back to... Count no, I've got Councillor Fleming first, and then Councillor Topping, and then Mrs. Sheet. Um, yes, thank you very much. Um, a couple of points I'd like to make. Just first off, on um, I'm trying to get a feel for what the actual scale of the problem is. And in reading paragraph seven, I was on page thirty. I was still a little bit unclear because we've got um, a census number of all children up to eighteen, and we've got a school census number of children <clears throat> over 5 to 18. Um, obviously, there's a difference. Um, but we don't have a number of, you know, a subset of that who are known to be in education or training, because obviously the difference would tell us how many roughly are not. Do we have that number somewhere? Thank, thank you, Councillor Fleming. Can I just, just, it's the number of children that are neat. Is that what you're asking? The number of children, your young people who are not in education, employment or trade? Correct. Yeah, we do have that. But I keep not pushing my button. Um, my colleagues in the skills team will be able to tell us our known numbers of children that are young people that are neat. I mean, that would be very helpful for the purpose of this scrutiny and, and particularly this paragraph. Uh, do you have it handy? Maybe it's on page 51, but it would have been helpful if it was right up front with the other re related information. Yes, we can. Uh, the participation tracking team can tell you the numbers of um, young people 16 to 18 who are neat. We can't do all children. Um, uh, okay, so we don't have that number then. F of children aged 5 to 18, who, which would be a subset of the number in paragraph 7, who... Well, do, we, do we know that... Not the number necessarily that's neat. We can deduce that. But do we know the number who are known to be in a primary school, a secondary school, home educated, or education training, so that we have an idea of the scale of the problem. Where is it in the report? I'm sorry, I was, I'm a sub, so I, I only had last night to read the paper. So, so we know the numbers of children and young people that are in publicly funded education. We know the numbers of young people that are, um, have been identified by the NEAT tracking team. We probably could have presented, that's a fair point, we could have presented it slightly differently in the report as a single table. But we don't know the total numbers because we don't know the numbers of young people who've never been registered no, but in I'm the talking school about, system. Sorry, I'm talking about the number of children who we know are in education. 
I know we can't get an exact number of the ones who aren't, because that's an unknown unknown, isn't it? But, but what I'm getting at is, if, if in paragraph seven we could have had a number, and all it is just one number, which said how many we know are okay. So we, then we would have a sort of a rough idea of how many were not. That, that, that's it's just a comment. It's made, it would make the paper, is it, is it somewhere in the paper? Sorry. The, the 104,000 that's next to it are the young people that are of compulsory school age. But what we'll undertake to do is we will do an estimate of all of those other figures and produce that for the committee where we know numbers at each cohort and put it in a single place. There will still be a gap, but we could present the information in a slightly different way. Thank you. Yeah. It, is, it, is, it is what we, we haven't... If you put your microphone on, of course, goes yes. the thank you. Could I just help there, because that's exactly the question that has been asked by um, Rachel and myself when we've gone through these papers. But just for clarity, and please forgive me if you do understand this, but it actually is the 104,458 children are between 5 to 8 who are in publicly funded educational establishments. So if we start with the 161,000, less than the 104,000 that we know of. Then we've got to find the number who are in independent schools, which is not possible, is it? Is not possible. The number that we know who are electorally uh, um, home educated, but there are some who are home educated that we don't know about, so that's another difficulty. And then those children who are CMC, which are uh, children uh, missing uh, education, we know that number, but the number that we don't know uh, and the number that you're asking for, which is a number that we cannot get to, is the number of children who have come into the county from another county and not registered in, into our, one of our schools. That's not the number I'm asking for. Fine, no, but I think, it's I made think... up of all those other things. That's the number you're asking for, is how many we don't know. No, I'm asking of the number we do know, because then we can have a stab at guessing how many we don't. And I realise we can't get at the number we don't know because it's an unknown unknown. Can we move on? Anyway, I, I, what, because, and also we've got a different age brackets for the two numbers in seven. So, you know, we don't know how many zero to fives are part of the 104,000. So, you know, let's, let's just move on and I'll ask my main question. I thought that would be fairly easy to answer. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to look at, at the... Um, exclusion numbers, and I realize the committee has um, looked at this before, but one of the things that really popped out at me was on page 37, we've got primary school, sorry, I'm looking here at suspensions actually, primary school suspensions in Suffolk are quite high, if I'm reading the colors correct. Um, That's something that we... Um, we numbers. Um, <clears throat> secondary school suspensions are not. And that's really strange to me. Where are these younger age children? Do we know? Um, and that, that's for suspensions. For exclusions, on page 35, the table the graph <clears throat> doesn't differentiate between primary and secondary. So it's not as easy to say, well, okay, these are suspended, these are excluded, because there's not a, you know, an apples and oranges <coughs> comparison here. Um, and I think my question is, why are there so many primary school suspensions going on and how do those count in terms of missing from school okay yes if you want to come in here, could, um, could i come through. in yeah. okay so going back to the first issue of the numbers martin hull is a number supremo and he uh, i believe will be able to get you uh, numbers in response to that first question 
and so there were there is a, you know there as we know s there are people missing from the statistics but martin will be able to narrow that down so could we undertake to provide those figures after the meeting at some point yes of course yeah okay thank you and then with the greatest of respect I don't think we're here to discuss the high numbers of suspension because we know, I believe, where those children are, particularly the primary school children, and that's a different issue. There are, it, it is known because we've had this discussion that there are, there have been quite a high number of primary school children suspended from school, but I believe we know where they all are, so they're not missing. That's okay, a different I, issue. Sorry, I, I assumed that because this was part of our paper, that it was part of what we were scrutinising. Well, part of the question we asked. Yeah, but I think that that's been explained in the paper, that there, it's acknowledged that there has, for various reasons, been an unfortunately high number of primary school suspensions. But we know where those children are, and they are... I mean, that you can expand on that. Uh, uh, absolutely. Um, we track all of those children. We know exactly which schools they're from. And for suspensions, um, some of them are the same child that's been suspended a number of times. I think your question about the inclusion in the report is we wanted to give as rich a picture as possible of all of the reasons why a child may not be in school. Now, the suspended child might be... Um, might be out of school for a day or two days, but they do return to school, and we thought we needed to include that. But our main area of concern and the committee's questions were around the children that are missing for a longer period. Um, and I would hope that the report demonstrates that this is one area that we absolutely know where the children are. Okay, well, that wasn't clear to me, and I apologize for that. Um, <clears throat> I am concerned about where the excluded children are, where they go, um, but then um, <clears throat> perhaps. Sorry, that's and we're concerned too, and, and that is uh, there is a and, big focus on that. And whether those, they return, to, how many of the excluded children return to school? But it would have been helpful, actually, in the paper to have had that broken down into primary and secondary excluded, as the other children, the suspended children were. We know those figures. That, those are you know those. known knowns, yes. So uh, is that part of the problem we're looking at, then? The, the um, ex permanently excluded children that don't come back into education? Well, they are known and are tracked and have provision put in place they for do. them. Do. And do all of them have provision, or some, do some of them just disappear? Not. No, not that we, we believe not. No, it's a, it's a group that we need to keep a very close eye on, but it is a group of young people that we know. And just, just coming back to you, it's an important question about those primary age children, where are they? Part of the increase in exclusion at that primary level and that spike that we can see there is because Suffolk as a, as a county has really clamped down on um, unofficial exclusions. So in some schools, historically what happened was um, Adrian misbehaved and his parents were told Adrian can't stay at school for lunchtime. The, the school are withdrawing the right for Adrian to be in school at lunchtime so he's sent home and we're insisting that schools record that. So a number of those primary exclusions are actually children that are not in school at lunchtime. Um, so, so they do return to school. But it doesn't. It is an exclusion because the school is excluded from part of the part of the process. But we do track those children, and we wanted to give. The reason it's in here is to give an assurance. We we know who those children are. We can provide a breakdown um, of primary and secondary in the in the permanent. Uh, Councillor Martin is gagging you to come in on this particular point. Yeah? Just on this point, I'm, if I can re possibly reassure. Uh, Councillor Fleming, that we have actually discussed this entire issue about suspensions and exclusions as a whole uh, freestanding scrutiny uh, issue and gone into it in depth. Um, and it, I think uh, the county is well aware of the high level of exclusions and suspensions um, and looked at all the reasons. And uh, the two reasons which I think are relevant to today are uh, the 
lack of comprehensive information and also the lack of some uh, helpful liaison between the uh, County Council and some academies. And I, I, I have to say that I think this is a theme that runs through an awful lot of the stuff that we do at Education Scrutiny, yeah. is that the local authority just does not have either the authority or the resources to do a lot of the things that it used to do. And that's the root of some of the problems that we have. Okay, thank you for that. Now I think I've got Councillor Topping and then Mrs Sheet next, please. Thank you. Can I go back, please, to the um, children, young people that are neat, okay? Um, this was sort of following up Sorry. what Councillor Spicer was, um, was asking. The elected home education, and I did toy with the idea myself very briefly when my two children were younger, uh, but I didn't realise at the time, until I've recently been um, told, that you actually get no money as a parent to actually do that. So you choose to take your children out of education for whatever reason, but you don't actually get any money to support that education. And then if you're uh, employing home tutors or the children are going to forest school or whatever, you are actually having to pay for that yourself because you have no financial backup from the government to do that. That's not a question. That was just a statement. However, on page 50, um, bullet point 92 and 93, I am concerned that some young people, whilst absolutely flying and going into university after a home education and having wonderful careers, absolutely brilliant, I am concerned that there will be some that won't be flying or going on to university or into an apprenticeship or anything else. And I'm concerned that in bullet point 93, it says that there is no statutory duty for us to track outcomes of people over the age of 18. And I think that's a real shame because being on the corporate parenting board, I know children that are in care, looked after children. We actually look after them until they're about 25 and there is a handover process and we make sure that they're okay. But there is no statutory duty for us to do that with um, young adults at the age of 18, so we don't know if they ever manage to go into apprenticeship or achieve a sustainable living outcome for themselves. And, and I would be really, I'm quite concerned about that, and I would like to, if we can, um, lobby, even though it's too late, um, the, the government to say, I think we should be tracking these young people and helping them a little bit longer to make sure that they are able to, to look after themselves. I don't know if Adrian's got anything or Rachel. <laughs> Th thanks for the question, Councillor Topping. I think from a, a government perspective, they're regarded as adults at that point, um, mm. and, um, and our services um, don't, oh, don't, don't cover that. I think it's fair to say that there are other agencies providing support. So although we, as a Children and Young People's Directorate, um, don't have a direct input there. Department of Work and Pensions, um, and we work closely um, with um, DWP in the east of England, have arrangements in place to support some of those young people or young adults who, um, who may um, have difficulties. I'm going to invite um, my colleague Michael Gray just to say something about the relationship with um, DWP in the east of England. Thank you, Adrian. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. Um, I think it's a really pertinent question, so thank you for, for the question. Um, and it's something that we actually uh, are keen to uh, enhance in terms of our collaboration with DWP at the moment. Um, just before this, this committee, myself and my colleague Clive Mobbs were actually in a, a discussion with DWP on the, this exact uh, point. Um, and there are certain things that we can do locally with our regional colleagues at DWP. However, there are some restrictions on the sharing of data between um, government departments. Um, it is something that we were keen to see included actually in um, our devolution deal going forward if that comes to fruition. Um, so I think we, um, we, are, we are doing things to try to uh, enhance that position and we have some data sharing that goes on but more could be done. Thank you. On page 52, um, barriers. I would like to, as um, a member for a rural constituency, mention that barriers, I didn't read anything in these barriers about lack of transport. 
If you live in a market town or even more rural than that, it is a huge barrier for anybody in this set at all to, to get anywhere, even the post 16 to 18, you know, they just can't get anywhere unless their, their parents get there. Uh, so I would like transport mentioned as a barrier in there. And also in the last bullet point, it says funding and resources, the European structural fund programs provided past tense. Do I assume it is no longer provided and are we getting that money from anywhere else? Thank you. I can come straight back in on this one as well. Um, so the, the European Structural Funds programme is coming to a complete close at the end of next year. So there are still some programmes running that are funded by the European Structural Funds. This includes the European Social Fund, which is the main fund that has provided for educational or training purposes in the past. Um, that was a fairly big um, pot of funding uh, that was coming into the region. Um, the position of government is that the UK Shared Prosperity Fund is the main fund that is replacing the objectives that were covered by uh, the European programmes. However, um, it's probably not surprising to hear, it is significantly smaller in size um, and it's covering uh, various objectives uh, as well, um, with the people and skills element only kicking in in 24-25. So there is some concern especially talking from a post-16 uh, position, uh, that the supplementary uh, support that we have for that age group for 16, 17, 18 year olds that uh, supplements what we do as a county council from the voluntary sector isn't going to be at the same level as it has been in the past when funded by the European programme. We are working very closely with our district councils and Ipswich Borough who are actually in receipt of the UK Share Prosperity Fund to try to make sure it's spent as effectively as possible, but it is a smaller pot and there is a concern about the uh, longevity of some of the support previously provided through the European funds. Okay, thank you for that. Mrs Sheet next, please. Thank you, Chair. I just want to start by thanking Mr Orr for such a comprehensive report. I found this incredibly informative and, and really wide-ranging. I want to come back to the heart, if I may, of children missing in education, and I'm particularly pleased to read paragraph 62 through to 66, so we've referenced this a few times. It appears that although the numbers of known children missing obviously fluctuate considerably, there is a really welcome trend downwards, and I'm interested in whether there's any further breakdown in terms of pupil age, whether we can learn anything about primary or secondary generally early intervention is better, so the earlier we can identify those children, get them into education, the better. And I just would love to hear a bit more about what works well. Can we do more of it? I think it's important as scrutiny we learn from success, and it does appear that the, the team has worked really hard. Um, and I suspect it's a very painstaking job, clearly referenced to a number of external agencies. Uh, and I suspect the work will never be done but it would be good to hear a little bit more about that and particularly perhaps reflecting on primary secondary. Mr. Sheet. Oh, Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Sheet, for the question. Um, and I can't take credit for the report. My colleagues here take credit for the report. Um, I'm going to invite um, Stuart to say a bit more about CME activity yeah. and, and breakdown and those sorts of things. Jane, um, thank you very much for your comments. Uh, you are quite right, the team is quite small, but incredibly effective. Um, and yes, we can break it down by age. But we didn't do, we thought the number was the number um, that we needed for this report. But yeah, I can uh, break that down because there are, are records, it's all recorded, um, so that we've got a, a good idea of where these children are going missing. Um, I think it's important to say that this is most probably one of the most biggest areas for safeguarding because when a child goes missing off a school roll, then we really try and do everything we possibly can. And as Jane has said, there will be times when we cannot find that child. And, and that is because they may have left the country. We may be able to find out they've left the country, but we don't know where they are. And that, that is something that, you know, we work with the border agency where we can. Um, and obviously they track families or can do. 
Um, we work with DWP, so when they move claiming benefits as such, we worked with the tax office. We work with all the different agencies to make sure that we follow every lead we possibly can. Um, my educational welfare officers get involved on a regular basis. We go knock on doors, we knock on neighbours' doors, we knock on different community leaders because we get a lot of good information and intelligence from local community leaders who know about families and where they've possibly gone. Um, and we do the utmost we can to find these children. And I'm always disappointed. And I think I really want to, to say to you, I, I, my experience crosses different organisations. And when there is a serious case review, unfortunately, an awful lot of children are labelled children missing education. Because that it does tend to follow a particular pattern, that when a child goes missing, then there can be a disaster. So I want to reassure you that my team and the officers around me, we put every effort we can into tracking these children and where they've gone. Now, where the, the, the issue is we're a small team, and I'll say that because I'd always like more resources, of course, but I'm realistic. I am realistic. You know, we're doing a good job um, and we will continue to do so. Where I think you may be able to help us is we have um, situations where we need to get more information and certainly with schools and academies we really want to develop this relationship of data collection because that is key to the tracking process. They have a statutory duty to tell us about uh, children missing education and, and they do. They're very good, but what we'd like them to do sometimes is a bit more f footwork before they report it, so that they make some local inquiries before they report it to us to give us a head start. Because you all know, the earlier you can get into a case, the better your chance of tracking that particular family. So that's my ask for you, um, and and. The ask is, you know, that, that schools do this for us, to help us. You know, we haven't got masses, a mass team, but if everybody did a little bit extra, just at that first point, then we would have greater intelligence and be able to, my team can then react a lot quicker to that information. Does that help? Can I just come in on the back of that? Yeah. Do, do our, any of our... Um, uh, Academy trusts have equivalent of education welfare officers on their teams, yes. or, or do they rely totally on us? No, they, they do. They have pastoral teams. They have very good pastoral teams. You know, hard-working pastoral teams, um, and, and some do actually have educational welfare officers. But in the main, they tend to use our services. We're very fortunate in Suffolk. We've, we've got a, a, a good number of educational welfare officers and we've got great relationships with the academies and, and the schools and we're able to work together. So the answer to your question is yes they do. Thank you very much for that and Councillor Spicer wants to come in. Well I was just reflecting on everything Stu was saying um, and whether there is the basis for a recommendation we might want to make there in, 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 in support of what he's just told us. Um, but also, when Stu was first talking, I just had another look in here in case I'd missed it. Um, is there some evidence and then something that we might be able to act on around the ethnicity of children who are missing from education? And in which case, um, and I've got a separate issue about refugees. Um, have you asked that? Yeah, no, well, down. yes, I, I, I think I'm asking a, 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 a much a different, a, a follow-on question. Sorry, let me get that right. Is there something that we ought to be able to instigate um, as a county council with community leaders, with faith leaders, um, and, and, and so on? I think, I think answer your question. I'm not 100% certain whether we've got the ethnicity data available, but I, I will look. 
Um, and certainly going forward, I'll make sure we have got it. Um, with regard to uh, working with community leaders, yes, you know, make, make, make communities aware of their responsibilities to look after children. And if we can actually work with them and try and find out where these families have gone, it will make life so much easier for us. Presumably we're in contact with them around safeguarding issues, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Does safeguarding training include the um, include uh, information about the re legal requirements for children to attend school and what to do if you're aware of children that don't attend school? Yeah, I'll, I'll let Adrian answer that one. Yeah, the safeguarding training, particularly the training that's done for the designated safeguarding leads in schools, <coughs> excuse me, um, really does highlight the need for um, everyone working in a school system, and when I say school, I mean a school or an academy or a free school, um, to be professionally inquisitive about what's happening with children and um, the, that, that importance of children coming and going up from school role is really emphasised. Uh, I, when, when I was thinking about safeguarding training, um, sorry, I perhaps didn't ask it clearly, I was actually thinking about the safeguarding training given to faith leaders and community leaders, um, rather than what we do within schools, to help, help make sure they realise uh, amongst the family situation that children are legally required to, to go to school. I did this Church of England safeguarding training the other day. I don't remember anything about children being, having to attend school on that. I'm not sure um, we're able to comment on the training available to different, um, to, to different faith groups. We know that our colleagues um, in the Church of England, our colleagues in the Catholic Diocese, um, do, do safeguarding training that's very similar, parallel to the training that, that we do. And of course there's different types of training that will have different emphasis in different programs but the programs that cover the same things that a designated safeguarding lead would have in a school would have some focus around children missing education thank you very much any more questions from the panel please okay well I'd, I'd like to ask a question because we've got an awful lot of uh, facts here and we have heard how you would love to see um, that register of children who are gone out of the system made a legal requirement, you know, particularly with that, as it involves um, education at home. But I wondered whether you had any other ideas about that, given either the authority or the finance to do it, really any improvements that we could make from where we are at the moment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I've got um, two or three things that I'd like to share. Some of them are things that people have already, um, have already raised. Um, the recording of a national register, I think, is only part of it. Um, and as, as I said at the beginning of the meeting, we don't know fully where the bill is going to going to get to. A register only takes us part of the way because there are, you know, there's a need for compliance then around it. And I'm acutely aware that there is um, a parent lobby um, that are very anti the notion of a register. Um, particularly, and if, if you want to see the evidence of it um, on the Department for Education website, um, the parental response to um, proposed changes to the elective home education regulations, about 90% of parents that responded said they did not want, they did not want that. And I think we as a council set out to be very respectful to home educating parents, but we genuinely believe that there are some some families who are not looking after their children as well as they should be and it's hard to pick them out in that group so not only do we want to see that that compulsory registration but we think there needs to be regular follow-up on it as well because we know that a young person um, can be taken out of school 
to be electively home educated in County Durham and then leave County Durham and then go to another county, go to Cleveland, then go to West Yorkshire and then end up in Suffolk. And in that journey, even though some councils may have known the child on the way, that's how they can become lost. So there is something about the regularity of checking in on that, on that register. I think the other thing um, that we're very keen on, and we've started some lobbying with our colleagues in the Department for Education, is at the moment, um, there is a system that is free in terms of the cost of the software. My colleagues will correct me if I've got that wrong. WAND isn't charged to schools. WAND, uh, we made reference to, is a package that essentially interrogates the um, electronic registers that schools use. And most schools now use an electronic registration system. Holds huge amounts of data. Um, my colleague Martin made reference to the fact that at the moment, for schools registered with WAND, um, they're collecting um, attendance data twice a day. So we've got 268 schools. 248. 248. So I'm over-egging it. 248 out of 324 schools. We would like more of a push from the Department for Education for all schools to be um, using that, not just in Suffolk, but up and down the land. And you could ask, you know, there's, there's officers comparable to me sitting in scrutiny committees in other county councils probably saying a similar thing. And there is a, there is a cost to the school because the school does have to put some time and effort in. And one of the things we know at the moment is that schools are facing real financial challenges. And one of the areas that they're, they're, they're trimming back is in administration. It's why some schools haven't had staff in over the summer because they're focusing their finite resources on making sure there's a teacher and a teaching assistant for in, in all of those classes. I think we'll see a reduction in school administration. Um, but I think if schools were um, obliged to use that system, it would make children safer across the whole country. And then there's an ask beyond the Department for Education mandating every school to use WAND. At the DFE end, they've got all of that information, but they share it with us in a summary that's not incredibly helpful because it wouldn't be useful for Martin to have twice a day the records of 104,000 children. We need it in a format that could be processed, that links in with other systems so that we would know fairly rapidly that Adrian Orr hasn't turned up in school. We'd, they'd, we'd know from the school record um, what my ethnicity is. We'd have some record of what the history of attendance might be. We'd know if I'm a SEND child. If that system worked, we would make children safer as a nation. So three big ones there um, in terms of the National Register, the schools using WAND, um, and the DfE allowing us to access that data. I'm, a, I'm a, an, an art teacher by profession, so I'm not, I'm not a technical expert, but Martin tells me we need something called an API. We need it in API format that would allow Martin and his very clever people to interrogate that and actually provide the sort of information, many of which sat in the questions you asked. Can we break it down by ethnicity? Can we break it down by phase? Can we break it down by national curriculum year? Um, if all of that happened, children in this country would be safer. Now, we can never entirely guarantee that evil people aren't going to do terrible things to individual children. But if that registration system um, and that, uh, 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 that level of us as a council being able to interrogate that information quickly, it will be particularly helpful. Fi final, final thing, and then I, I, I'll stop. Um, it's in the same way it's a right of a parent to electively home educate their child, um, it's their right to send them to independent school. And many families will send their children to independent schools, and many, many you know, young people will do extremely well um, in, in independent schools. Um, and, and there is an incentive for a parent that's sending their child to an independent school to ensure they're there, because it's costing them money every month to do that. However, there are children that will disappear in that system. 
So ensuring that whatever happens with the data collection, there is some sharing of independent school registration. I think we came close to that in the pandemic because we were asked to ask the, the independent schools. And I think I'm right in saying, and Martin will correct me, the very big independent schools actually work very collaboratively. They work very closely with us um, around safeguarding. We have, a we, have a, we have a relationship with that sector. Um, but independent schools come in very different shapes and sizes, large and small, and some can be very small. Um, so I'll stop there, Mr. Chair. Hopefully Thank you very much. Helpful. Pretty comprehensive. Anybody else in the, in, in the witnesses got any other things they'd like to add to that, things they think we could do if only we had the authority or if only we had the DOSH? Okay, then, Izzy. This is all related, but um, one thing, and um, uh, Councillor Spicer, you said earlier, something pragmatic that we could go away with and, and think about and um, support us with. Um, Maria and I have um, a particular kind of challenge around, um, you'll be aware of the local authorities section 19 duties around providing a suitable or arranging a suitable education for children who are not able to attend school due to exclusion, illness or otherwise, and it links to the EOTAS policy, our medical policy and so on. And we have been working with other local authorities, so we know this isn't just a Suffolk challenge. We know there are some questions in neighbouring authorities and beyond around this as we formed a sort of informal group of support around this issue. The exclusions illness is okay, is the otherwise, and there is some competing guidance now for local authorities. We are wholly wedded to our statutory duties around Section 19. Absolutely, we don't shirk our responsibility at all. But there is some competing guidance from the Department for Education around the particular element of otherwise. So, children excluded, illness or otherwise. For example, in the new attendance guidance, there is evidence of those children being medically unfit to attend school partnerships working together, agencies working together, health professionals working with schools, working with local authorities, etc. Some of that is in direct competition with the guidance which is now quite out of date in 2013, which is the guidance for local authorities around children unable to attend school due to health needs. 2013 guidance is now nine years out of date. It predates the SEND reforms, it predates the SEND code of practice, um, and it still talks, for example, about medical evidence being provided at consultant level for children out of school due to illness, and we know that isn't always realistic. It does say that we have to work with professionals around other evidence available. However, that there isn't that same level of, if a child's out of school due to illness or otherwise, and we are finding the otherwise now is largely children around school refusal, emotional-based school avoidance, which we know since the pandemic has been on the increase, we would like some greater clarity around, is the otherwise that as soon as a child's been out of school for 15 days or more, the local authority is entirely responsible to arrange that suitable provision um, or is it still that there is some evidence needed and needing to be provided to say why that child is out of school, such as medical evidence, for example? And that is a particular challenge for us at the moment, I think it would be fair to say. Clearly, we want to get our responsibilities right. We work hard to do that all the time. We have mechanisms in place now to support those children. But there is 2013 guidance, there is the latest attendance guidance, and the two don't quite marry up. So some help around that would be much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for that. Anybody else want to talk? To? Oh, we've got some questions over here. I think, I think were you first, Councillor Oven, and then Councillor Martin? Yeah, I mean, it's not a question really. It was the case of what we can put forward um, either to the cabinet or to the portfolio cabinet member. Um, I mean, obviously, I think we need to have a report back when this school's bill is finalised, or if there's, in the meantime, if there's anything that we feel they, they are missing. Um, and the other thing is the slightly, cons well, more than concerning about the Caroline raised about the EU um, structure funds and what we have now got in its place 
and should there be some sort of recommendation to Cabinet to consider what the implications are um, for this, what's called the Shared Prosperity Fund, um, and if that is that now adequate, particularly, I think it was, Caroline, for um, students that are neat. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, I did have a question for, um, I think, probably for Martin Hole, actually, rather than for Adrian. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm sort of taking it that the reports that you're getting from the Department for Education, it would be very helpful if they were not just, uh, and I don't know what API stands for either, but, but, uh, uh, but I do get the point that, uh, that Mr. Orr was making, but also that they produce automatic exception reports, because there is no point in a report which... Uh, reports on 144,000 children. What you need is a report on the 10,000 children that are not doing this or the 7,000 children who fail to do that. You know, the, the, the exception reports is absolutely essential um, and uh, there is no way that we've got the ability to wade through uh, loads and loads and loads of unnecessary material in order to get at the stuff that we actually need. Um, I mean, I have to say, I think that is part and parcel of government, both at local and national level, is that if you want to try and make sure that you don't have any, uh, any um, politicians interfering in anything, you produce a report which is so long that they can't possibly read it. Um, but, uh, but I'm sure that that's not what, uh, what we want coming from the Department for Education. On the, on the issue that uh, Ms. Connell was making about uh, illness, I think that's incredibly important that there should be clear guidance uh, on whose say-so we should have for whether or not a child is not well enough to attend. And one of the reasons I say that is because there was one case many, many years ago uh, where the first time I'd ever come across this and I actually uh, was a bit taken aback to discover that it was a thing at all, where I was under the impression that uh, the child in question was probably suffering from Munchausen's by proxy because the mother was very odd indeed. Um, and uh, it was a situation where the mother was not sending the child to school because she said the child was ill. But, you know, we need, we need to make sure that we have guidance in place so that we can turn around to parents under certain circumstances and say, no, your child is not ill, your child will go to school. Any comments on that from the team? And to say that's very helpful. Thank you very much, because that is the position we find ourselves in. So thank you. Thanks for that. Um, okay. Well, you're feeling better soon. Councillor Spicer wanted to come in. Yes, I think we sort of moved on. I, I was trying to follow through what Izzy Connell was saying, and particularly about the mysterious word otherwise. Um, but when we come to our recommendations, we might be wanting to think if there's anything we can influence locally. Um, I'm a, not a great enthusiast of writing letters to secretaries of state asking them to consider this because they may not be in the job by the time the letter arrives. <laughs> what with the postal strike, with postal strikes as well. But in, 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 no, I mean, it doesn't rule it out. And, and we do have very good contacts, both at officers and at a political level with the government, so it's useful to learn, learn these things. Um, and I, I think following through, which is, Penny's gone, or was it Caroline, both of you, um, about the knock-on costs of the changed funding after Brexit. Um, we might just want to have a bit of discussion. I just wanted, uh, before we finish with officers completely, I was just going to make a comment or almost a correction about um, refugees. I can't see, remember what page it was now. Admission for refugees. So last question. Yeah, can I just do that now, Chairman? Yeah. Um, by way of explanation, we have Ukrainian refugees staying with us. Um, and I experienced, with a lot of distress, the school admissions process, which isn't all of which is perfectly accurate what you've got here. It doesn't apply to 
if you're applying for a reception place. Um, and that isn't clear anywhere, that if you are applying for a place in reception, um, you have to go through the county council's admission system. School can't, you know, like they, the school can do the in-year ad admissions themselves. Um, and you get categorised as a late application. So Mr Putin didn't time it right for me to make the application in time. Um, but just for the record, everybody needs to understand it is different for reception than this. Uh, nothing's inaccurate here. Thank you. Any come back on that, Angela? That's all. Shall I, yeah, just to clarify that um, we still have a requirement to coordinate the admissions for the normal year of entry at a school. So regardless of um, what school or status of school the parents wish to apply for for reception or going into year seven at high school, um, all those applications come through to us and we then coordinate with the admission authorities and with other local authorities. Um, we don't, the requirement is not on in-year applications. So for in-year, so for years one to five or outside of the normal year of entry round, they are done um, parents have to go directly to the admission authorities. So that is all documented within our Schools in Suffolk booklet on our website um, as well. But take your point that, you know, late applications, um, it's difficult, the timings of that, um, and that by that point, um, places could have been offered already. Okay, thank you very much. Any more questions, please, from the committee members? Councillor Topping. Sorry, I've just gone to page 54, which was question R. The question says, what would help in keeping a proper track of children and young people in Suffolk? And the second bullet point says, appropriate resources for council to manage the new requirements of the register and the, and the additional duties it will entail. Appropriate resources. Can somebody please define, do we need more money and where do we need it, please? Thank you. So, so if the, um, the registration arrangements go through, that's an additional burden on the council. So our expectation is that central government would provide, as it does in other cases, if there is a new burden. I mean, burdens are the technical word, we'd welcome it. Um, but we would need additional resource, and that's not county council resource, that is central government resource. And you know, my equivalent officers in other, other counties are saying the same thing. Does, does that answer your question? Yeah, but can I just come back? Because when you said additional burden, you had an additional burden, although they're not a burden, of the 16 to 18-year-olds having to stay in school or education, but you didn't get any extra money for it, did you? Small sums of money, but of course the bulk of the money for that is in schools and colleges because they, when we talk about education funding, um, the vast majority of that in Suffolk sits in schools and in colleges. Um, we get a small amount. So there was a small amount of money, but not, but, but, but schools and colleges did get a little bit of additional money. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, committee, well, if, if you're finished with questions, we can either now move on to recommendations immediately. Um, it's 10 past 12. We have been going for more than two hours. If anyone feels we should have a lunch break now and come back, say, quarter to, quarter to one to finish off recommendations and then um, deal with the other things on the agenda, what is the feeling, please? Push on. You prefer to push on, right. Let's go then. Can we hear committee's recommendations from what you've heard this morning, please? Twice, well, it does seem to me, um, I'm never very good at recommendations, but an awful lot hinges um, on how things progress nationally and if they progress, doesn't it? I think that is true. Yeah, yeah. Around the data and then what we are able to do with that data. Um, I think somebody behind me, maybe it was Penny, suggested that we'd have to go back to this subject at a certain point when we knew what, if the national 
register, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, was going to exist. That, that is, I think, completely true. Um, Councillor Martin. Yeah, I mean, I think there are certain things which, uh, I mean, obviously, uh, if there is any possibility of uh, doing any lobbying on the schools bill, then I certainly wouldn't be opposed to that at all. I'm just, I was sounding a note of caution about how possible that might be. But there are lots of things which don't require uh, legislation, but which do require a change in the way that the government does things, and, uh, and the way in which the DfE reports are made available to the council is uh, one of those areas where it doesn't require legislation at all, it just requires the DfE to do things differently. And in that case, I think uh, joining with our colleagues from other education authorities across the country uh, through the LGA to put pressure on the DfE uh, to provide information and reports in a way which is helpful to enable the County Council to keep track of uh, those children who are falling off the system or who have not been registered in the first place would be a sensible thing to put forward. Record of that. Councillor Spicer. And, and, well, could, could we have some sort of recommendation? Um, and I'm happy to get guidance um, around um, children from ethnic minorities, both gathering the data, but more importantly, then leading to a discussion if there is influence we can use within those communities, um, community leaders, I, I hope I'm using the right words, um, to make sure that in training, awareness training and safeguarding, the legal requirements, as well as the moral and practical one reasons that children should go to school but we, we can't be certain about that and if we don't know the data yeah okay councillor fleming <coughs> yes thank you um i'm just wondering whether there's anything that could be done to try to reach the parents of the children who are not going to school. I mean, presumably the answer is that not much because we don't know who they are. But is that absolutely true? I mean, every child has a parent or parents. Where, where are they in this picture? And is there any mileage at all to trying to reach out to them? Mr. Roll, what do you think about that? I think Councillor Fleming's suggestion is a very good one, and we did put a one of the bullet points was you know considering a county-wide campaign. We ran a campaign some years ago um, around persistent absence um, back in the day when we were producing posters and, and that that sort of material, and we got a sense that there was um, some success with those in doctor surgeries in health clinics because we did see an improvement in some some aspects of persistence absence and I know Councillor Hodge talked with com comms about um, uh, the County Council's communication team about a campaign but perhaps we could extend that with local media some some key messaging that might influence um, exactly the group you're talking about Councillor Fleming they might not be on our register but they might listen to the radio or they might turn up at somewhere where there's some information yeah yeah I, th I think there's some mileage in that. Do you think there's any scope at all for, you know, reinvigorating such a campaign? Certainly sort of in health settings, in, in, um, in, in uh, family hubs, that kind of um, place, or possibly even on the back of buses and things like that, you know? Are your children missing education? I, I think it's a new campaign. The landscape's very different um, than it was when we did it all those years ago. Um, I think there are other strategic partners that could um, contribute to that, the voluntary sector. Um, campaigning is not my area of expertise, but I think there is expertise in the council and in some of our, uh, with some of our partners that could assist us um, with that. So definitely want to explore. As a recommendation, it's, it's worth looking into. S certainly we believe so.
perhaps as part of that, I wonder if we could revisit Stuart's suggestion that schools might be encouraged to make further earlier inquiries about children missing in education. That local knowledge could be really valuable. So perhaps Stuart can wordsmith that. But I think if schools were given a set of questions, I'm sure they'd be very happy to, to liaise as they do so effectively already. Something that was said, whether it's, a, it's possible for us to kind of extend our interface in any way with independent schools on this area? Well, I, I found it very slightly peculiar that we didn't approach independent schools on a regular basis asking for numbers of children and numbers in Suffolk. Um, like we did apparently during the pandemic. But isn't that going to be part of the government's new register that they'll identify children in independent schools? Again, we're yeah, we're decision. waiting for that to happen. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested in this WAND programme. So we need to try and encourage all schools, including the independents of whatever size, to use this WAND pro programme and in a format, an API format, I don't understand what it means, but an API format. But also, taking up what Councillor Sandy Martin said, you actually want the data that is unusual rather than being bombarded. I saw the, the programme, I think it was The Crown, where the Queen apparently used to turn the red box upside down because the stuff at the bottom was the stuff they didn't want her to get to. <laughs> now, whether that's true or not, that seems highly logical, and I'm glad she never told them because otherwise they, they would have reversed it. But it seems to me that if you've got so much data, you can't possibly manage it then you need the data that is getting to the crux of the issue. So somehow we need to get all schools, regardless of whether they're small independents, large independents, or whatever, to use this WAND programme, which I understand is free of charge. The cost to them is the resource of inputting the data. So somehow we need to give them the resource to input the data to get it all up and running to give you the information you need in a format that you can read to get to the children that we want to address rather than totally blowing your mind and you're not actually getting anywhere. Also, sorry, moving on from that, that I am really concerned that Michael's not getting the money he needs over there from this UK Shared Prosperity Fund. I would like to know what the shortfall is between what you were getting and what you're going to get. And if we need to tap into the district councils because they're getting it, we need to know how we can tap into that money to get it back to education. District councils don't have an obligation to, for education, so why are they getting this money and we're not? Maybe that's another conversation. <laughs> Thank you. And I take it when we were talking numbers there, um, Martin, that 248 out of 324, they're public funded schools. That doesn't include independence, does it? Uh, no, that, that will just be the, the, the schools that are pub, pub, uh, not publicly funded. There's some work to do in sort of getting that 75% up to 100%, presumably. Yes, I mean, it, just to get, put it in context, um, Roughly, we've said, was it, is it, I'm going to call it 100,000 pupils in, in Suffolk uh, being, being educated by, by the local authority. Um, two attendance records a day, five days in a week, that's a million records. So there is a, there is a good reason why we can't have it all coming flowing in, uh, but I believe there is a lot more that the DfE could do to give us a summary of the data which would make it very, very useful. Um, it also not only includes the attendance, it will tell us where pupils have been excluded because those, those, any attendance mark that is on there, that is what, that is what we get to see. So um, yeah, any help that you can offer uh, with that. Um, just to kind of clarify, um, I, my understanding is that the schools will already be using these management information systems to put in their own attendance data. and. I'll be brutal with you. I understand how an API works at a high level, but not exactly what it stands for. But basically, what it does is it sucks that data straight out of their system and pops it into the DFE system, um, and then allows me on a dashboard to look at it. Um, so yeah, and what I need to be able to do is get to that data. Um, at the moment, I cannot download it. And 
Do beg your pardon, do come in. Just on the point, obviously, the, we're coming back to on the UK Share Prosperity Fund. I um, just thought I'd clarify in terms of um, education um, and funding going to the districts. Um, it's funding for people and skills rather than education per se. So this is, this is more about the apprenticeship support that can be provided to all age groups, um, but 16 plus obviously is, is part of that. Um, uh, support that can be provided to, uh, to those that are unemployed. Um, but that obviously does include to some degree our 16 um, to 18 year olds as well. So it's where that crossover really is between people and skills and education. That's where this money is, is um, focused on. Um, just to clarify as well, we are, uh, as I very briefly mentioned previously, there has been conversations at both a um, Suffolk public sector leaders level and at a uh, chief officers level as well across the the districts and with the county council about how we make sure that it is coordinated across Suffolk. Um, there is a little bit of um, surprise, I think, across all authorities that this money has been distributed in this way. And what we're very keen to do is make sure there is no postcode lottery as such between different areas and make sure there is a uniform approach of support. The problem in terms of the level of funding still remains and I would still welcome that uh, opportunity in whatever way deemed appropriate to raise visibility of what that risk actually looks like. And I'm right in thinking that we're not getting that money, but districts and boroughs are getting it. Uh, that's correct. There is a possibility that if there is a county deal, that that would then re revert to the county council. Lovely. Any more points, please, members? Right. Is it you all wish that we ask Helen to just um, summarise what's just been said and then we'll go away and turn those into, you know, realistic recommendations, then circulate them to the, the, the team to endorse. Is that a fair way of going forward? Are you happy with that? Can you just give us a quick summary of what you've got there, um, Helen? So, um, I've got on here about lobbying, um, well, hang on, I started off as lobbying the government for around the school, school bill, but it's um, a recommendation to join up with um, other education authorities to put pressure on the DfE to provide um, reports to um, local authorities in a way that's helpful so that um, the councils can help it will help track children that have maybe fallen out the system. Sorry, these will be worded much better. Did we not change lobbying to going through the LGA? Yeah, well, I, I think I'm just... Or is that I something else? Made, yeah, yeah. yeah I've got, that's where I said. Um, I've got something here about the um, ethnicity data. Um, so, and following on to that is influence to influence community leaders and about safeguarding training um, around the legal and moral reasons for children to be in school. So, training for community leaders. Um, some a campaign to join up with other strategic partners um, around <coughs> the importance of attendance. So, to reach out to parents. Um, I have. Um, about uh, to encourage schools to come back with, um, I've got this over here as well, um, to do, perhaps do more um, investigative work as to why children may not be in school and then providing that to uh, Stuart Hudson's team. And um, encouraging schools to use that package, the one package, uh, then just around this the European funding and what's just been discussed there. Sorry, that my, my notes here are all a bit over the place on that one. And I think that that is it, unless I've missed one here. Um, yeah, the, it was back to um, provide the DfE providing data to, to um, the councils that was in a more helpful way. I think that's 
Councillor Topping, please. So, sorry, I think we might have missed something that Izzy said. Yeah. Right, and I don't actually understand what I wrote down here, but apparently we've got 2013 guidance that needs updating, so it actually yeah. works in line with the latest attendance guidance. Now, who, who puts that? Who? National guidance. That's national guidance. So how, how do we update this 2013 guidance? So that Izzy's got the guidance she needs that all works in the modern school rather than the schools that were taking place pre-COVID, please. Okay, I actually have got that down here as something to follow up, and I think Helen has as well. So we put that down. That presumably is taking that up with the LGA and such like as to. Yeah, it, it's that. specifically guidance about uh, the uh, health, the the who are signed up who are I able to uh, make recommendations about the health of the child I mean that's that was the I think that was the specific point wasn't it, it was about the health of the child and who actually gets to say whether or not the child is ill um, I mean I think that's really important Yeah, just in case it's helpful, thank you. Just in case it's helpful, it's that section 19 exclusion illness or otherwise, and it's that otherwise because we've all talked about safeguarding, for example, here today, and it, it is exactly as Councillor Martin says who is able to ratify or verify that a child is out of school due to otherwise reasons. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Councillor Spicer? Yeah, the other subject I got a bit fussed about, and I, I, but I don't think there is a case for a strong recommendation was around um, home education. But I think the answers we got and the information in the paper makes me think that there's probably, we're probably doing the right things in Suffolk, uh, uh, as we've gone as far as we can sensibly go. I mean, a, we had good explanations about how it works. And um, indeed, and, marked and improvement so the over the past that, three years. I mean, I, I, I slightly fussed at the, the expression they were not in education set it because they were being home educated. Those that are being home educated that we know about and we check up on, um, we shouldn't be concerned about. I mean, it's a, 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 right, a, a right that people have, a decision they've made. It's those that say they're being home educated that aren't properly being taught or aren't being taught at all and I, I'm not certain what we could recommend today that isn't being done already to reach those people but if there is now's your chance to say so but I, I, I was left with the feeling that there probably wasn't other than lobbying for the National Register I guess sir. Chair, maybe we should be calling for Ofsted to go around and visit every family that says they're home educating. I think if I may just come in on the elective home education, I think a challenge that we face is um, they're significant numbers, it's a small team, they do a remarkable job. Um, I think if the numbers increase any more, we're going to face a real challenge. We hope the numbers go in a different direction, but it's a team that, like a number of the teams that have made reference here, it's a relatively small resource that we are using as effectively as we possibly can. I think you said, Adrian, or one of you did, that some of the rise in numbers was around COVID, people that started doing that in COVID and haven't stopped. Did you not say that? Yeah, yeah certainly there are, some, there are some cases. It's, it's a rich group of, of people. There are different reasons. Um, many are dissatisfied with the school system and Lindsay and her team um, and, and, and the support of wider teams in the council assist some of those return to school, res resolve some of those issues. Councillor Topping. Can I just clarify, have we helped Stu with his educational welfare officers within our recommendations? Because Stu said that he would actually like the schools to actually be, have more educational welfare officers on the ground doing some of the groundwork before his team get engaged. Is that, have we actually addressed that? Can I, yeah, I, I, they're not actually within schools it's not the educational welfare officers that do 
some of the form filling as such. It would be the administration staff or the pastoral staff. I, I'm not looking to try and put uh, extra educational welfare officers within schools because I think they've got enough to worry about without having to, an, another employee. What, what I need is the admin staff to make some more inquiries through the pastoral staff with the families to find out where they think the families have gone once they've been reported as missing from education, once they've come off roll. Yeah? Does that make sense? Can I come back? W will that help if we get Martin's WAND programme sorted out? Will that data come through the WAND programme or is it something else? No, it, it won't. All, all it will do is uh, the, the WAND programme just talks about who's in school on a particular day, not, not who's not there. And the reasons, yeah. Okay, well, we will shake those down outside the meeting, agree them with you, um, Councillor Topping, and then circulate them to all members for agreement, and then we will make that as the recommendations of the meeting, all right? Now, I've taken lots of notes here, which need to be sorted out. Um, if we now move on then to the information bulletin, I think you've been issued with a supplement to the um, information bulletin about the Joint Task and Finish Group on Tackling Childhood Obesity. Um, just like... Yes, by all means. Yeah, well, I think we are. Uh, um, yeah, I think we are finished. Only in discussion about the future work programme. That was the only... The rest of the team, yes, I think, yeah, would be fine, yeah. That would be good. Thank you very much indeed for your attendance this morning, Paul, and a bit of this afternoon too. Hey, uh, coming back to this question of, of um, the task on finish group, um, paragraph 411 there, I'm very glad to say that we're going to have an additional member of the Health Scrutiny Committee. In fact, I think is the Ipswich Borough Council uh, representative to Health Scrutiny is going to join us for that, which I think is, uh, which is very good news. Um, and we'll be meeting next month, I think, on that, aren't we? The task on finish group. Yeah, I think we are. That's good. Um, if members have got concerns about the, any of the information in the information bulletin, which they feel the committee should look further, please raise these under agenda item 7, the forward work programme. And if indeed we can move on then now to the forward work programme. The committee is asked to put forward suggestions for its forward work programme as set out on page uh, 63 to 65 of the papers. Um, the next meeting of the committee is on Wednesday the 14th of December uh, when the committee will be considering an update review on progress on the council's um, SEND action plan and I think we have a meeting planned for October the 29th, uh, is that 20, 25th sorry, um, it's not the 29th is it? it's been changed to the 25th uh, so that is actually quite soon just um, 11 days away so if you've got anything specifically you want me to to um, make sure gets into that review uh, please let me know um, subsequent meeting dates are listed on the Fort work, work program for the committee's information um, are there any other topics members wish to propose for the forward work program or request for information bulletins please
Councillor Martin. Well, it's not an additional topic, Chair, but I mean, the, the, the um, proposed uh, look at school place planning, admissions, and school transport, um, and that's not separate, that's together. That's the whole point of it, is that they are all linked. Um, that was proposed in March of this year, and it's already been put back because uh, we decided not to hold it, not to discuss it in September. Um, we haven't got anything scheduled for June. Can we provisionally schedule it for June next year, please? No, it's not. The, 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 the thing on page 63 is about the building of school places. It's not about uh, the ability of children to get to the schools that they've been allocated to. Are you saying you'd like that to be a combined topic, in effect? One topic. School place planning, admissions and school transport is about whether or not we are actually exactly allocating children to schools that can to actually get those to. together. Yeah. Well, Chair, if we, if we put all that in March, we've already got two major issues cap happening in March. We can't, we can't do everything in March. Uh, no. um, and we've got Suffolk County Council's response to the Ofsted report on sexual harassment in schools scheduled for that date at the moment. Councillor Topping. I'm sorry, I'm confused. So in December, we've got the update on SEND. In March, we've got school places, buildings, maintenance and sexual harassment. So why can't we do the planning in June, as Sandy's just asked? All we needed to do is put a date in there instead of date to be confirmed. Um, I'm sorry, can I, can I show you, Chair? May I stand up? <laughs> so... Councillor Martin, that you want the, um, the item which is at the foot of page 63 in effect amalgamated with the potential fruit? Um, no, Chair, I don't want it amalgamated. That's the whole point. I want us to consider school place planning, admissions, and transport. It's not whether or not we're building schools, it's not whether or not we're admitting children to school, it's not whether or not we're providing transport. It's about whether we are actually providing children with admissions to schools that they can get transport to. That's why they have to be linked. There's no point in talking about building schools in places where children can't get to or in providing transport for children who don't need it. Sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. just struggling <laughs> with, with the concept of breaking those two things up. To me, it's one and the same topic. That's the problem. Um, guidance. <laughs> I'm somewhere nearer Sandy, I think, on this, but what I'd like to ask, and with officers here, is the whole issue of school transport linked to place where we build schools and places, which is something I'm super sensitive about, as you know. Um, is, if we were minded to make any recommendations that affected school transport, I don't think it makes much difference whether it's March or June, because any recommendations we make then have to go through a series of hoops and loops. So it wouldn't affect admissions for September anyway. 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 Uh, the other, well, whilst I've got the microphone, um, I know that your dis the December meeting is going to be focused on um, the send update. And I'm sorry we're not allowed to ask questions on what we've got today, but take your lead on that. Um, 
ought we to be thinking about a, 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 another SEND progress report six months further on? I mean, I, I realise you're trying to stick to one item, a meeting, but maybe if we fo focus the items down a bit more, we could do two items, a meeting. Well, that is also true, but the trouble is the, the SEND issue is, of course, a big issue in itself, isn't it? That's the snag. Yeah, I think part of our problem is we ask too many questions, so we get loads of answers. <laughs> so we spend a lot of time on it. Um, well, today is actually, I mean, it's not a criticism, but we asked 15 questions or something. So how many? 17 questions. And actually, maybe if we'd asked four questions, um, that were things that we thought could really make a difference. I, I just feel that four meetings a year, one topic, what, and, and we've been given the specific responsibilities around keeping a, a, a scruti scrutineering, is that a word? Scrutinizing eye on SEND services. And we've also been tasked, I mean, I certainly felt I was, to keep an eye on how school transport changes roll out and the, and then the link to where we build new schools. Um, and, and with only four meetings a year and we're 18 months through the cycle, we could just populate through to the next election now. Unless we try and do two subjects sometimes. Just that when we, when we then do that, we find ourselves you know, wanting to go on two o'clock, half past two, this kind of thing, and people don't wish to stay that long. They have other commitments. That's been my reason for um, trying to limit it to one topic and doing it properly, uh, or as properly as we can. And we've got to have the obesity stuff come back. Mm. Well, that will come back with the task and finish group. That's, yeah. that's also true. And that ought to be done by March, shouldn't it? Although, well, it will certainly come back here as well, won't it? Because it's a joint, it's a joint initiative, although it's Councillor Fenton. I think we discussed it yesterday, and we're reckoning it will come back to our March meeting. So we, we could take that as an information bulletin, though, I guess, couldn't we? Well, we check the dates, because which comes first, health scrutiny or, or, um, or our date, the 7th of March? Um, I can't remember the date in March that our health scrutiny is, at, usually towards the end. Just getting a um, note here that um, so the health scrutiny could actually invite education scrutiny members to the March meeting. Um, there's a suggestion that perhaps there's a workshop to do some. As indeed we had a joint meeting previously on this, didn't we? A joint meeting in March. Um. Yes, I think we were going to look at dentistry in March. We may have to have a, that's quite a big topic. Maybe we Somebody could... get our teeth into it. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe we could have both, if people are, have got some stamina. What do you want to do? Have it as a topic for us on the 7th of March, which means actually we need to have it all wrapped up and done by the middle of February, um, which I think is quite ambitious. But um, I just found out what the House Rating Committee meeting date is in March before yeah. the Because it's just like a dozen House Rating in March. If you've already got something in your programme for March, we can't do it then, can we? Well, well we might be able to fit it in. I, I mean, I, I can't decide now. I need to talk to Teresa. Uh, right. See if Councillor Martin. Chair, Chair, do we not have any. Um, reserve dates for scrutiny meetings in May. Because if we've got a reserve date for a scrutiny meeting in May, 
and we're going to have a joint scrutiny meeting between health and education, children and young people services. It would make sense actually to do it on a separate date as a separate meeting and if it was in May then it would be late enough on for us to know that we'd be ready with the results and, I think and it wouldn't conflict with all the other things on our diaries. I, well, I, I, I think Sandy, I like that idea actually I, and maybe there was there would be another thing we could look at together. Let's, let's do that. Should we put that provisionally day? in for a reserve meeting date in, in May? There's no reserve date in May, I've just been told that also. <laughs> um, I've just been told that the health scrutiny is 19th of April, not in March. Ah. <laughs> Well, I don't want to sit here for a long time. We need to talk to we, our we need to respective talk to officers. The respective and officers about getting that sorted out, I think. We, need, we know we've got to do it, so let's find a way. It's either going to be March, April or May. Is that all right? Councillor Topping. Mr Chairman, um, I am perfectly happy if you want to do two subjects in one day, for us to do two subjects with one in the morning a proper lunch break and one in the afternoon because if we're here then we may as well be here for the day so if you want to do two subjects then I am perfectly happy to be here to do two subjects as long as one is in the morning we have a substantial lunch break and one in the afternoon rather than coming in extra days well, that seems a very realistic proposal and which I think yeah, particularly when you kind of come from Beckles which is no short journey is it <laughs> Oh, that's a Could I warning of a power cut. Yes, yeah, so I think pressing my button has always done. No, um, just to add something more to the complication, um, but for, for thoughts afterwards, um, because this is the Education and Children's Services Scrutiny Committee, um, it's not the case that I'm very, very keen to be scrutinised to um, a great deal, but um, there are obviously... <laughs> it is a case that there are other, you know, items within children's services that are not on the list, but I just leave that hanging. Thank I'm you. conscious that there's going to be some kind of safeguarding inspection next year. Is that, can you tell us more about that, um, Councillor Reader? Yes, we are you know, anticipating that those inspections will come along soon and therefore scrutiny. Who's the cabinet member for obesity? Well, that's partly public health as well, so it's... Um, <laughs> yes, I understood what, uh, um, but that is with it was it in public health as well, because um, that was under my old portfolio. But I just throw that in that there are other items that could be scrutinised for a later date, but that could be discussed outside the meeting, perhaps. Yeah, and perhaps I'll have a discussion with you about that safeguarding issue, because I know that there is there is a desire for us to have a look at that um, sometime before the middle of next year. So we'll get that sorted out as well. Thank you. Unless anybody else has anything they wish to raise, we can declare the meeting closed. And I can ask you to take your belongings, paperwork, and any rubbish with you. Thank you very much indeed for your attendance. Thanks to our officer panel and um, for all the advice and um, responses they've given us towards this pretty wide topic, really, I guess. Um, and we'll see you on the 14th of December, yeah? Thank you very much.